Hello everyone, it's Dr. Ryan coming to you from my office again with another step one question review. Today we've got a nice cardiology, hemodynamics, and physiology question from the Boards and Beyond QBank. So let's get started. So the question says, the table below shows hemodynamic measurements from patients A through D. Which patient's readings are consistent with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And we've got a table of values for left atrial pressure, left ventricular pressure, and aortic pressure. We've got normal values and values for patients A through D. Okay, so this question has been in the Boards and Beyond QBank for several years. It's been answered hundreds of thousands of times, but only about 50% of students get it correct. And I think the reason for that is because the hemodynamics around hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are something that can be confusing at the med student level. But I'm gonna show you that this is actually a very simple question. And if you just understand a couple basic principles of fluid mechanics, you can easily answer this question. So let's imagine that we have a blood vessel and we want blood to flow through this vessel. And let's imagine that the resistance to flow through this vessel is very, very low. It's essentially close to zero. Now let's imagine the blood pressure at the end of this vessel is 80 millimeters of mercury. So my question to you is, what does the pressure have to be at the beginning of this blood vessel to make blood to flow? Well, if there's essentially no resistance to flow, then the blood pressure only has to be a tiny bit higher than 80 for blood to flow. Remember that fluids always flow from a high pressure to a low pressure, so the pressure here at the beginning of the vessel has to be higher than 80, but if there's very little resistance to blood flow, it doesn't have to be much higher than 80 at all for blood to begin moving. It could be, let's just say, 80.1. I'm making this number up. But something just a teeny bit higher than 80, and then blood will begin to flow because this is a blood vessel that has very little resistance. Now let's imagine we want blood to flow through this vessel, but there's a severe narrowing, and blood can only flow through this tiny pinhole of area between the narrow parts of the vessel. In this case, what does the pressure have to be to make blood to flow? Well, it can't be 80.1. Blood will not flow with a pressure of 80.1 at the beginning of the vessel because that is not enough pressure to drive fluid through this tiny pinhole. Instead, the pressure will have to be something higher. For example, 100. It might have to be as high as 100 in order to drive fluid to flow through this narrowing. And so the point here is that anytime you have narrowing in a blood vessel, you get very high resistance to blood flow. And that requires a lot more of a pressure difference to drive blood flow. In other words, you can't just have 80.1 and 80. That's too small of a difference. It won't make fluid flow through this structure. You have to have something like 100 compared to 80 in order to make blood move. And when the difference between the pressure at the beginning of the blood vessel is 100 and the end is 80, we say that there's a pressure gradient across this narrowing of 20. Anytime you have a narrowing or an obstruction to blood flow with high resistance, you're going to need a substantial pressure difference in order to make the fluid flow. In this case, in this hypothetical case, we need a difference of 20 millimeters for blood to flow. Okay, now I want you to imagine that this is not simply a blood vessel, but instead it's the left ventricular outflow tract. It's the pathway that blood must move through in order to move from the left ventricle over here to the aorta over here. Now let's imagine that the pressure in the aorta is 80. Well, if we have a very healthy left ventricular outflow tract with no obstruction to flow, where the aortic valve opens very easily, then we could have a small pressure difference like 80.1 in the left ventricle and 80 in the aorta, and blood will move through that left ventricular outflow tract. However, if there's a narrowing, an obstruction to blood flow, and the resistance to blood movement through the LVOT is high, then this 80.1 isn't going to be enough pressure to make blood move. Instead, the left ventricle is going to have to generate a much higher pressure, for example, 100 millimeters of mercury, or maybe even 120 or 140. The left ventricle is going to have to generate higher pressure to make blood move through the LVOT when the LVOT has a narrowing and an obstruction to blood flow that generates a lot of resistance. And there are two disease processes that cause this to happen. One is aortic stenosis, and the other is obstructive forms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In both of these disease states, it is difficult for blood to flow from the left ventricle to the aorta. So the left ventricle has to generate a substantially higher pressure in order to make blood move out of the left ventricular outflow tract and into the aorta. 
And in these situations like aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we get a pressure difference between the left ventricle and the aorta of something substantial like 20 millimeters or 30 millimeters or 40 millimeters. That pressure difference, also called a pressure gradient, is necessary to move blood through this left ventricular outflow tract that has a high degree of resistance. So the key point here is that in systole, when blood is leaving the left ventricle and going to the aorta, if a patient has one of these conditions, there's going to be a pressure difference between the left ventricular pressure and the aortic pressure in order to make blood move through this narrowing, difficult to flow through left ventricular outflow tract. So if you understand that, then it's very easy to quickly answer this question. We are looking for the patient where in systole, there is a difference between the pressure in the left ventricle and the aorta. That pressure difference or pressure gradient indicates some obstruction to blood flow like you might see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So first look at the normal patient. The systolic pressures in the left ventricle and the aorta are the same. There's no gradient. This indicates this is a normal patient who doesn't have aortic stenosis or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now let's look at patient A. We have a pressure of 140 during systole in the left ventricle and 120 in the aorta. This is not normal. There's a pressure gradient here of 20 millimeters as blood goes from the left ventricle into the aorta. That means there's some obstruction to blood flow, and that is what you would expect to see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You could also get these same findings in aortic stenosis. And if you look at the other three patients, they all have identical systolic pressures in the left ventricle and the aorta, so those answers cannot be correct. None of these patients have an obstruction to blood flow out of the left ventricle like you would expect to see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, so what are the take-home points from this question? First of all is you have to understand this basic principle of fluid mechanics, which is that when there's an obstruction to flow, you get a gradient, a situation where the pressure before and after the obstruction are much different from each other, creating a pressure difference between the beginning and the end of where blood is flowing. If you understand that basic principle, then you can understand that in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or aortic stenosis, you will get a situation where in systole, when blood is flowing from the left ventricle to the aorta, there will be a pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta. That's what you see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and aortic stenosis. And that concludes our module of a step one question review.